well. We have a guest speaker here today. Anybody heard of a show called Duck Dynasty? So I'm, saying, I'm thinking that's a yes, right? I had the privilege to meet uh, Jay's Robertson last night. He was the speaker for our On Our Heroes event. And didn't he do a great job, those of you that were there? He was fantastic, <laughs> ministering to uh, people, encouraging them. It's a pretty amazing thing that in a public event like that, he was openly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is amazing. You say, Pastor, how, how does that happen? Let me, let me just teach you a little bit. You saw all of the opportunities to serve. You heard about the people who serve. We believe in our church that we don't go to our community like this. We go to our community like this. We give, we bless, we serve, and somehow that opens doors for the gospel of Jesus. How many know that's, 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 a, that's the way Jesus did it? He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom, and that's what we want to embody as a church. But we're so glad today that Jace is here, and uh, I just want you to give him a great grace welcome as he comes to share God's word. Will you welcome Jace Robertson? I hadn't even started yet. Look, I was like in Indiana last night. I'm beginning to love Indiana. Thanks for having me. Thanks for encouraging our family, view of social media through the years. I am not ashamed that I love Jesus Christ. So uh, if some of you may not have seen our show, and so you're looking at somebody like me, and you're like, what in the world is going on? <laughs> what is happening? It's a bizarro world in the church. I'm not a preacher. I don't look like a preacher. When I was a kid, my number one fear, number one, bigger fear than death itself was public, you're laughing and I hadn't even got to the end yet, <laughs> was public speaking. I went to a speech class in the ninth grade. I thought it was going to help me enunciate. It was going to learn the English language better. Look, rednecks have a problem with the English language. I, I can talk about them because I am one. You know, my mom recently had something wrong with her leg. She goes to the doctor, gets it checked out. She comes back. My dad said, how'd it go? I was sitting there because we were worried about her. It was a pretty rough infection. She said, well, they did an autopsy. <laughs> and they got me some nitroglycerin to heal me. So my dad said, so let me get this right. They're going to blow up a dead body? <laughs> Y'all think I'm making this up. That conversation happened. <laughs> we have trouble communicating. And then they're sigh. Number one question I got last night. Y'all are cheering. Look, this guy has caused me a lot of stress in my life. Is he as crazy as he seems? You know, did the cameras do that? It's way worse. <laughs> if we didn't have editing, the man is a psycho. <laughs> but he loves our country and he loves the Lord, and so we love him. I mean, so I'm here today, hopefully, to raise some hallelujah. My buddies, when I was young, they used to say that, you know, they would say, hey, we'll go out there and we're going to raise some. They didn't say hallelujah. What about you? And I've already told you my biggest fear is public speaking. So you say, what happened? You see the show, you see my family, you say, what happened? I want to give you a verse to 
plant into your mind right now, because I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep it real. That was kind of my joke. I'm speaking. I don't look like a preacher. It helps my message. You say, how does it help your message? I have no other reason to declare Jesus Christ as Lord in your life other than the fact that I believe it to be true. That's it. I get paid and have gotten paid for years to do duck call seminars. <laughs> I go around and toot on these things, you know. I did last night. You may give you a one-minute crash course. Okay. If you want to be a world champion duck caller, it's not that hard. You take one of these duck calls. You go to Stuttgart, Arkansas. I think it's October. They do the world championship duck calling contest. You take one of these, you get up on stage, everybody's watching, thousands of people, and you do this. Here's your routine. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> These guys do this, and women, all day. Some of them pass out. Some of them turn blue. It's exciting. At the end of the day, whoever can do that, the loudest, the longest, they, without any mistakes or squeals, they crown the world's greatest duck caller. In America, awesome. <laughs> so my dad came up with an idea. He said, you know what? I'm going to build duck calls that sound like ducks. Because that's not, a duck doesn't do that. I mean, you've been to a pond. Some of y'all are looking really confused right now. You're like, well, what just happened here? Well, this is what I did for a living. I, I built duck calls. I'm going to give you the backstory on why this started. My parents were not Christians when I was a kid. Did I give you all the verse? I said I was going to give you a verse. Did I tell you? Y'all thought I forgot, didn't you? I, I was just, I wanted you to feel nervous about that because when I give you this verse, I want it to stick in your head. The verse is Hebrews 13, 8. Before I give you the backstory, Hebrews 13, 8. Does anybody know Hebrews 13, 8? Just raise your hand. If you're, uh, there's, there's four or five people in here that's reading their Bible. I said Hebrews 13, 8, and they stuck their hand up, and they know me. I might call on you to tell you what it says, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but I love it that you're in the Word. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today. Oh, well, now you know. You cheated. I started. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? The backstory on the duck calls is that my parents did not follow Jesus Christ when I was a kid. In fact, when they got old enough to know right from wrong, like all of us do, they chose a heavy dose of wrong. It led to a hill on the Arkansas-Louisiana state line where they leased a bar. My dad controlled it with two pistols. I told this last night. And then, you know, when you're living in sin, he was a raging alcoholic, abusive husband, abusive father. Sin is not rational. He came up with an idea one night. We were staying in a trailer, didn't have much money. He came up with an idea that we, and I mean we as in my mom and the three kids at that time, they later on had my younger brother, Jeff, we were the problem. Now, how rational is that? You're out there smoking dope, horrible husband, horrible father, getting drunk every night, sleeping with whoever, not being loyal to my mom. And then you come in one night. Now, obviously, it was drunkenness-induced. And you're like, y'all, get out. So my mom, I remember sitting there thinking, this guy is nuts. <laughs> so my mom loads us up. We head to West Monroe, Louisiana where they currently live. And my mom didn't know really what to do. She went down to one of the local churches, 
slept in the car that night. She went down to the local churches, and she said, you know, I need some help. She told them the story. One of the pastors there said, well, we would like to talk to your husband. She said, bad idea. <laughs> he ain't coming here. <laughs> and he said, well, I'd like to go to him. That man, Bill Smith, we put him in the ground a few years ago. Trust me, he'll be back. <laughs> Just being honest. Some of y'all don't know what that means. That's why I'm glad you're here this morning. He said, you know what? And you call it the Holy Spirit. You call it God working. He got a fella. They got in that car, and they drove to that state line. They walked into that bar. My dad was sitting there, had a big tall Budweiser between his legs. He was sipping on. And they introduced the person that I just said on the verse, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They introduced him. I used to go around and speak, and I used to go tell the story of Jesus, and I quit doing that. You say, what? Good garden seed, what did you just say? <laughs> a story doesn't mean as much to people if you don't know the person who the story is about. You've heard the story of Jesus. So when I say they introduced Jesus to him, it's what I'm going to do today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we come to churches, here's what happens. We detach ourselves from the world. We, we compartmentalize Jesus and our faith. You say, okay, let's go worship God. We go to the church. We worship for an hour. And then guess what? Then we go out there and live however the heck we want to live. And then we're wondering why our kids are looking at us saying, something ain't right here. Oh, it's getting personal in here now. It's getting hot. <laughs> I told your pastor, I said, one of the things I say everywhere I go, don't listen to everything the preacher says. <gasps> God uses flawed people, and we're all flawed, to make Jesus Christ known. What does that mean? At some point, they're introducing Jesus. At some point, you go to this. This is what happened with my dad. You go to this and you say, who is this Jesus Christ? You read on your own. You say, yeah, but the Bible's so thick. How would I know? You're going to learn the Bible in less than 60 seconds. You ready? Genesis to Malachi, it's a pretty big section. Jesus Christ, God in human form, is coming to earth. Bam, you just got that whole section. You got the point. <laughs> you said, well, wasn't there a law and it tells the creature? Yeah, it was the law. What was the law here for? To prove that we're all flawed. You can't do it. So what? So Jesus Christ is coming to earth. I'd love for you to clap at that. Matthew to John. Next section. Jesus Christ, God in human form, is on the earth. He's here. I love John 1.1. 1, 1. You know, in the beginning was the Word. Because Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. They're not up there waiting. When you're eternal, you don't wait on anything. <laughs> you're eternal. Your mind has trouble grasping the awesomeness of God. Just look at creation. Look at the galaxies and the stars. and Somebody designed that and built it. You can go with what you taught, got taught in school. 
I went to public school. They said it, you know, they said, Jace, basically, theoretically, if you boil it all down, we came from fish. And they told me, this is what they told me. This is my biology teacher in the 11th grade. That's what she said. I said, so now we're frying up and eating our ancestors. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> so then you have Acts to the Revelation. You want to take a shot at it? Does anybody want to? We get, for you that are slow, Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. Number three, we got Acts to Revelation. Anybody want to take a shot at it? He's coming back! <laughs> yep. So you say, well, why Jesus? Because God, you have God the Father, you have Jesus the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. Those are the three things that you see here, but they're actually one. Difficult to explain in less than an hour. But that's, that's how it is. But Jesus came because God is so awesome and so beyond our ability to understand. I mean, he's making a man out of dust. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> okay, well, it's ludicrous, right? That's what he did. That's the story. We're going with, made a woman out of a rib. So a lot of people, especially people that I talk to, they're like, I just, they can't get past Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3. They're like, this, well, then we have an ark and we have all these animals. I, I, they're out. How, how could you build a boat that big and you come up with all these arguments, you know? And I'm like, well, hang on. Genesis 9, I perked up when I read Genesis 9. You know why? When the water went down, God made an announcement, and this is where this comes into play. He said, from now on, have you read Genesis 9 lately? He said, from now on, the fear and dread of you will fall upon, and he starts naming food groups. He says, the beast of the earth, the birds of the air, the things that crawl around on the ground, the fish of the sea. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Now, some of you all say, what in the world are you talking about, Jace? It's the birthplace of hunting. <laughs> the redneck translation of Genesis 9, 1 through 4, God says, run! <laughs> read it. You don't believe Read it. Read it. So when people say, I can't believe you're shooting a duck and putting him on a grill, I'm like, look, I got orders from headquarters. <laughs> They say, well, I just want to eat broccoli. Great, more for me. <laughs> it doesn't hurt my feelings. So what did they tell my dad? They introduced Jesus. My dad had some problems. They didn't talk a lot about the problems. It's pretty obvious. Now, it's not obvious when you're in the moment. He was a man's man. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to do what I want to do. You look up, you know, and your wife's gone. Your kids are gone. The law's after you. Your hands are shaking because of all the stuff you're putting in your body. At some point, you've got to say to yourself, this is not working. So they introduced Jesus and it happens to be the greatest love story the world has ever known. You've got to consider, number one, who created all this. I talked about that a little bit. I love Hebrews 3, 4 because it says every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. You said, what does that mean? If I brought y'all down to my house and I said, look, this house that I'm living in just popped up, came from nowhere, y'all would say, well, Dace, you've turned in the side, your uncle. <laughs> you've lost it. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It's absurd. 
because you know by the design that somebody built it even though you didn't see it being built. As an outdoors person, I hunt. I'm in the outdoors. My dad later on took me hunting in an effort to become a better father, which was a good move. I started looking at the details of creation, and I thought, somebody built this house. I wasn't in a church building. Somebody built this house. Too much design. Too much design. You said, do you believe in science? Oh, I believe God's the greatest scientist we've ever known. You can take a watermelon seed, put it in the ground, cover it up, back up, water hits it, <laughs> comes a green vine. Where's that coming from? I raised my hand in biology. They said, that's photosynthesis. I said, well, I need to meet that person. They said, oh, no, it's not a person. <laughs> it's a process. They said, Mother Nature. I said, Mother Nature? I need to meet her. <laughs> not a person. They're trying to explain the house of God, the design of God. DNA, I love DNA. If your DNA is found at a crime site, guess what? You're in trouble. <laughs> we trust that with our life. They will put you in prison and close the door and lock, away, lock you away and throw away the key. We trust that design. It's a complex code in your body. They figured out how to look at it in a microscope. And they said, boy, it's carrying information that your cells need. And they're unique. In fact, it's the most complex code that we've ever seen. If you unraveled it, just one person's DNA would go to outer space. Well, i got a question. Who wrote the code? Let me get this right. This all started from a spark hitting a mud puddle and a fish, and we had this sophisticated code, the most sophisticated the world has ever known in your body. Seemed like we could come up with a more complex code. So you have that. And then you say, what's that got to do with my life? So Jesus comes to earth. He lives a perfect life. Isn't that what God should do? If we're going to have a God, we need one that's perfect. We don't need a God that all of a sudden could change and go to the dark side a million years from now. Amen. That's not going to work. That's what gets me about people. They'll have a bad religious experience. That's why I say you can't always listen to the preacher. We're flawed people. We introduce Jesus. The preacher's doing his job when he's pointing people to Jesus. He's innocent. Jesus is 100% in it. You can trust him. He said, well, how would I know? You got four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and somebody highlighted it in red for you. When we were in Hollywood, which is crazy, <laughs> all these people we work with, every kind of lifestyle contrary to what this says, I worked with. You say, how'd y'all get along? Well, you know we brought a lot of them to the Lord, right? <laughs> and it uh, wasn't us. They had in their mind a stereotype of how, we're gonna, how we were. But they didn't understand. We're flawed. The difference in us and the world is that we're open about our flaws. We live in the light, John 3. And so when they came and they would ask us, we wouldn't say, come to church with me. They ain't coming to church with us. I'd say, read the book of John and see what Jesus is like. You see what he's like. I'd say, well, what do you believe about this lifestyle or this or so read the book of John and see what Jesus is like. 
They come back, tears well up in their eyes. Wasn't what you thought, huh? They're like, nope. It's the greatest love story because God is love. He didn't decide to love you. He is love. I don't go around and talk about humans' DNA. You know why? Because people argue with you. Well, I don't believe that came from God. I talk about God's DNA. You can find it in John chapter 1. He's about three things. He's about life. Jesus is life. Remember when he said, I am the truth. I am the life. I, I'm just, I am life. And it's about light. I brought up that John 3 because the most famous verse in the Bible for God to so love the world, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes shall not perish. Well, later on he talked about why people don't embrace Jesus and you keep reading. They don't want to come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There is a raging war of good and evil. It's one of the greatest evidences that there is a God. Because whether you believe or not, you understand good and you understand evil. The tricky part comes up when you've got to say, you know what? I'm bad. It's tough. We don't want to be bad. We want to justify our bad decisions ourselves. I've already told you, Genesis to Malachi proved that's not going to work. He gave us the law, you can't keep it. We make mistakes, deal with it. So he sends Jesus. My dad hears that. His first word was unbelievable. And they said, nope, it's believable. He lived a perfect life. They led him to a cross. He volunteered to do this. He became a man because God is life, so he can't die. He just is. That's why he went around saying, I am. He's like, before Abraham was, what? I love it. I am. Oh, I'm going with a person like that. <laughs> he is. He became a man, why? So he could die. Acts 2 is a very interesting verse in there. It says, he was raised to life because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You know why? Because he's life. You can't kill God. He did that because he loved you. That's what we deserve for our mistakes. So my old dad, those tears welled up in his eyes. He came back from the dead to show you and me we can live again. That's why I told you old Bill Smith's coming back. So am I. Amen. Romans 8, 11 says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if it's living in you, will raise you from the dead. Same spirit. I went to Israel I was wondering when this timer was going to come on. Good. They got, they got, I was getting nervous about that. We got time, so we're, we're on schedule. I went to Israel last year, and what it did was, I've read the story. I explained it to you. This is, this is a love letter from God Almighty to humans. It's not a rule book. I was wrong. I was so wrong. It's not a collection of fairy tales. I was wrong. So I went to Israel. And this, it kind of gave the pictures to what I was reading. Where I was at. Now, I want to share one moment with you. We went to the, the place of the skull, and we're listening to the person. They talk about, this is where we think Jesus died on the cross, you know, and it's moving. You know, you go to the Sea of Galilee, and I'm looking at all these flathead catfish swimming around. I was like, I got it. You, one of the first things he did after he was resurrected is what? Had a little fish fry on the bank. <laughs> I get it now. They were flathead catfish. <laughs> Loved it. I thought about those guys looking in the eyes of a man they thought were dead. 
they thought he was dead. It's the greatest comeback of all times. I heard them say that after the Masters, Tiger Woods won it, and they said, boy, what a comeback. You know, he immortalized himself. I heard one of the announcers say that, I thought. Ah! <laughs> Putting a ball in a hole? Immor immortal? <laughs> no. You want to come back? Put your body in the ground for three days and then come out. Now that's a comeback. Oh, yeah. So we're at the place of the skull. Then they go down. They have a tomb. And, you know, they're walk-in tombs. So Missy and I, and you go one at a time, you know, and they got it all blocked off. And I don't know. It wasn't. I'm, I'm the type of person that I keep it real. So I wasn't, the way it was seeming to be dramatic, it wasn't affecting me whatsoever. I'm, I'm a realist. I go in there, I go in the tomb, I look around, I'm like, interesting. But I'm going to tell you something. When I stuck my head out, oh, I had a moment. I said, oh, yeah, this is what happened. This is real. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When that's real in your life, things change for the better. Amen. Things change. My dad got in a vehicle. He drove down to West Monroe to where my, wife, my mom was working. And he repented. Not because he wanted her back. Yes, he wanted her back. Because he had been introduced to Jesus Christ and he had surrendered to him. Yeah. And you say, what's that got to do with me? That's your dad. Because when I got to be 14 years old and I was introduced to Jesus, I went to my dad and I said, is this what changed your life? And he said, yep. So here I am. As a kid, I was bitter towards my dad because, rightfully so, he was a hellion. Even though he changed his life, didn't care, didn't make right the wrong he did for me. Some of you can say that. Bad things happen to good people. Some of you were born in tough circumstances. And it's the reason you turned out making a lot of bad decisions. But you know what I realized that day? It may be the reason, but it's not an excuse. This is what God is good at. You remember in John chapter 9, man was born blind. They said, whose fault is this? He didn't even answer the question. He said, this happened so that the work of God may be displayed in his life. The one in us is greater than the one in the world. I mean, how many verses do I need to read? So I said, you know what? If I'm going to appeal to the cross, the bloody cross, the grace of Jesus, if I'm going to appeal to that, Forgiveness for my mistakes, I'm going to have to forgive my dad. Forgiveness is contagious. So I did. Now, my family, remember what I said about the preacher? Jesus is what saves you. How you respond to him more religious groups have more different ways. You go to any religious group, and there's 101 different ways on how they do it. And guess what? I unite with Jesus. You fall in love with Jesus, guess what? You'll figure it out. So you do declare him as Lord. You do accept him in your heart. You have a moment. You get to baptism Religious people in the leadership world, they love talk, arguing and talking about baptism. Pastor's probably nervous about what I'm fixing to say right next. <laughs> Jesus saves us, right? We're saved 100% by grace. We're united on that. 
But I want to read you something. I, I, I want to help you understand this. I woke up this morning. I'm sure not going to take any credit for it. I, I believe it's the Holy Spirit of God, the same one that's going to raise, rise me from the dead. Raise me from the dead. I want to read this. You know, Romans, uh, before I read Colossians 2, Romans 10 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's easy enough, right? Well, why don't we just go out and declare that? Because people don't know Jesus. That's why I introduced him today. It's that simple. There's two teams God's team, he shows what he's like through Jesus, they win. Then there's the, evil there's the evil world, the evil team, controlled by the evil one on the earth. They lose. <laughs> Make a decision. <laughs> Y'all heard this. Don't be stupid. So you say, what do you got to say about baptism? That's Romans 10, 9. Romans 6, of all the things, because this is the hardest thing for Christians to understand, people who follow Christ. When I come to Christ, what do I do because I still sin? What, what, how, I, I've already told you God uses us despite our flaws. Now, my dad was different. I was different. Still mess up. God still uses you. So don't believe the lies that, oh, you can't do this. So that came up in Romans 6, and they, they asked him a question. They said, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now, that's what it says. I know that's hard to understand. But that question was, well, if God's forgiven us, why don't we just sin some more? Now, look, it, God knows your heart. If you're trying to slick God, guess what? You're going to lose. He knows what's going on. But I thought Paul's answer in Romans 6 was significant. The one thing he brought up about why you don't do that, he said, don't you know that all of us who were baptized, we died to sin? He, he was giving you a reason on why you don't go out there and live like the devil when you have experienced the grace of God. Grace of God saves you 100%. Don't misunderstand. I'm just reading the text. This is before Romans 10. He said, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized, I'm quoting it, were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. Now, that's what it says. You say, well, what does that mean? God gave you an opportunity to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Someone who falls in love with Jesus, you don't have to tell them, well, you think I ought to do that or not. Oh, he's running to the water. <laughs> he's running. So don't, don't, don't water that down. All right? It's, Jesus is what saves you, but you have an opportunity. The reason I bring that up is because when I walked down to the riverbank at 14, here's my dad, me and my dad. We had embraced Jesus. We'd fallen in love with Jesus. But we had a moment. I'm going to walk down in this river, and I'm going to bury this old man. We're burying that stuff. We don't want to see him anymore. All right? It was God's idea. It wasn't mine. You say, here's what's uncomfortable in the religious world. They say, well, you're saying that somehow you're saving yourself. We've already established the fact that you're not good enough to make it, right? So hear me out. And this is Colossians 2. Now, I'm not even going to read it. I'm going to let you read it. Here's what I figured out one day. I thought I'd share this with you. And it hit me this morning. Here's this evil battle, Jesus and the evil one. It started in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. Jesus obtained victory the last way you thought he would, through surrender. See, the evil one, when Jesus died, he said, okay, I win. He never realized, and 2 Corinthians 2 says this, 
They didn't know who Jesus was if they would, the dark rulers. They would have never done that. He actually won through surrender. You're in a war. You wouldn't think waving a white flag would win. So you say, what's that got to do with baptism? You're waving a white flag. You're not doing any work. You're doing the opposite. You're surrendering to Jesus. You're surrendering. So, here's what I'm going to leave you with. My priorities are this. God, God, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I introduce him to everybody I come in contact with. Now you're realizing why I got over my number one fear. Was it you that got over it? Oh, no. God did that for me through the Holy Spirit of God. So I want to take my last five minutes and talk to the young people. Now the parents, you can listen. I'm in a spiritual war. My priorities are God, people, but my family. Because, I look, I'm trying to lead my family to heaven. I believe Jesus is coming back, and I don't want my kids looking around saying, well, how come you didn't try to get me to go with you? 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 is real clear on that. There's two kinds of people out here when Jesus comes back. Those that will be surprised and those who are ready. You figure out what camp you're in and make the needed adjustment. If Jesus Christ comes back in the next five minutes and you're surprised, guess what? You weren't ready. I was on a plane in the cockpit, private plane. They said, you know, you're listening to all this. We have an emergency landing. I was like, ooh, somebody's having an emergency landing. I look over there. It's the pilot of my plane. <laughs> you said, what was the emergency landing? We went straight down. Say emergency on the way down. You know what I like? I was ready. I was ready. I was way more ready than he was. <laughs> so you said, what'd you do? We got in the car, because the plane, you know, we, might, we survived. We got in the car, and we had to drive five hours home. I thought, boy, I'm fixed to have five hours to explain to this guy why I was ready. <laughs> Guess what? He's ready now. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So I want to talk to your kids. The hardest people to reach in our society are our kids, especially those that come to church. They don't develop their own faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and they watch you, and they see your flaws. And some of you are going to have to rise above like me, and you're going to have to find Jesus despite the way you were raised. Your parents might have done a lousy job, but guess what? No matter how good a job they did, they make mistakes. So, kid, quit blaming your parents. If you're going to be surprised when Jesus comes back, that excuse is not going to work. Amen. So I'm going to tell you one quick story. I noticed an attitude change in my daughter. She's 15 now. This is within the last few weeks. I thought, what's going on? I said, go get your cell phone. Because my first two boys, I gave them the cell phone, and I said, look, I'm going to check this cell phone. And if there's anything funky in here, you won't have a cell phone. So guess what happened? 24 hours later, I checked the cell phone. There's something funky in here. No cell phone. My next kid, same thing. So I told her, go get your cell phone. I said, is there anything I'm going to find in here that God wouldn't be proud of? She said, nope, it's all good. I said, you know I worked with Hollywood, right? I have people... Their eyes are real close together. They stare at computer screens all day. And if you've deleted something, I can find it. She's perfectly fine. So I thought, well, okay. Well, about a minute later, I look and go, hmm, this ain't good. Snapchat's where I, well, now, the sound of that should tell you something right now. <laughs> and look, I'm going to be real with you parents. You wouldn't hand your kids a gun and say, hey, figure it out. Oh, no, well, that's dangerous. You don't think a phone's dangerous? 
Read 1 John chapter 2. There's three things. Phone can be used for a lot of positive things, but I know there's three things going on there that's real easy to access. The cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, especially on social media. And your kids are trying to be accepted, and they want friends, and they want to be cool, and so they go to places like Snapchat. So I don't want this story to get long. So for two days after I whooped her butt for lying to me, I have one rule. You lie to me, you get your butt whooped. I said, you're too old for me to whip you, but since you lied right to my face, you leave me no other choice. Now, you discipline however you want to. I said, lean over that chair there, and I'm going to give you three little pops. It was more the idea of it, you know, because tell me the truth and we'll deal with it because we live in the light. It's not that Jesus don't want to forgive you. So I posed as her for a couple of days. I got to know her friends real well through Snapchat. And uh, then I called a group text with her friends because I could see her eight best friends on Snapchat. And I was like, this is me as dad. Things have changed. If you want to be friends with my daughter, you will bring your parents over to my house and we will have a talk. If you want to make better decisions, we'll move forward. So six of the eight did, through these the past few weeks. There's been a lot of tears. Uh, we've shared Jesus. Some of these people, they're not Christians. You know, it's been awesome. So I tell you that to say this. It's not about policing. Look, we introduced Jesus. We all have mistakes. Some of these girls who were the very worst, some of her friends, my daughter has been surprised that they're the ones most open to following Jesus. Look, life is messy. It's tough. But don't go off to your separate rooms with your separate phones and just waste your life. And then you look up and your daughter takes her life or gets hooked on drugs and you're like, what happened? We're in a war. Ephesians chapter 6, he's got a whole armor there for you to wear every day. But I wanted to introduce Jesus to you because, look, in the end, it's not about us. It's about showing Jesus to your daughter, to your son, to your fellow worker, to your family. God uses us despite of our flaws. And if there's a way to live forever, if there's a way to duck on in heaven, Jesus, Jesus is the way. And if I don't see you again... I'll see you in heaven. Amen. Thanks for listening. Stay standing, everybody. Stay standing. I'm going to ask that no one be moving, please. And would you bow your head and close your eyes? And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus the way Jace described him, I want to invite you to surrender your heart and your life to him right now, today. And if that's you, you say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready to take that step. I'm ready to, I'm ready to surrender. I recognize it. I need Jesus in my life. And I want to invite you to begin your journey of following Jesus with a prayer of surrender. Would you pray this way with me? And anybody that would like to pray with them, just pray, dear God, thank you for Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I surrender everything in my life to Jesus. I confess Jesus is Lord. He died and rose again. And from this day forward, I'm following you. Holy Spirit, would you help me to serve Jesus with all my heart? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody give God praise for every person who's prayed that prayer. Come on, you can't patty cake for that the greatest decision anybody can make. Amen. Now, I want, you to, I want you to hold steady because, okay, you say, what's my next step? Well, the next step is what Jesus just described, baptism, water baptism. 
And two weeks from today, we're going to be baptizing folks in water. So I want everybody to take this connection card in your hand, everybody that you already filled it out. And there's a place on the bottom say, hey, I'd like to be baptized in water. I'd like to learn more about that. Or if you uh, make your decision to follow Jesus today, would you mark that box that says, I'm committing or recommitting my life to Jesus? And just mark that. We're not going to hound you. We're not going to chase you down. You know what we are going to do? We're going to pray for you. We're going to help you. We want to resource you. As a matter of fact, if you're beginning your relationship with God today, we'd like to talk to you at that red information tent. We'd like to give you a Bible if you don't have one so that you can start reading it. Start in the book of John, like Jay said, and, and uh, just start this journey of following Jesus. And uh, you'll be glad that you did. And we welcome you on the journey of following Jesus. Am I in the right church here today? Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Again, if you would just stay steady, our ushers are going to come right now, and we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. And uh, so if you are giving a tithe to the Lord, thank you. If you'd like to contribute uh, an offering toward our guest speaker, you can do that as well. If you're a guest here this morning, you're under no obligation whatsoever to give today. Uh, this is something that we ask of all of those who are regulars here at Grace to contribute uh, to what God is doing. Aren't you glad that we get to be part of this Sunday today? How awesome is that? You say, Pastor, how did that happen? Well, because you gave. And because you're faithful in giving, we get to be part of days like today. Now, this is your uh, place to turn in this connection card with your information. And if you'd like to uh, be in the drawing for Jace's book, Good Call, uh, I just read the subtitle, Reflections on Faith, Family, and Foul. All right. Make sure you write down your information, and we'll text you here in the next few minutes, the winner, and you can pick up that book on your way out, all right? So let's pray, and then we're going to give today. Lord, thank you for all that we have received, all that you have given to us through this service, and but most of all, God, thank you for Jesus. And God, we pray today as we give, as we, as we uh, take the next step of following you, we pray, Lord God, you give us courage to do it, and help us, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stay steady while we receive the offering, if you don't mind. Let me give just a couple words of instructions on your way out. Uh, if this is your first time here, uh, we are going to dismiss here in a moment, and then you're going to leave. Uh, when you leave, you're going you're to leave on the south edge of the parking lot, and we're going to ask that everybody go to the second turnaround on 31. Okay, everybody say second. Second turnaround. Now, there's a little cut through that's real small that you're going to be tempted to, to cut through. Please don't do that because you'll back up track it, traffic kind of like the Greenwood Freedom Festival last night. We don't want to be part of that, and it actually could become dangerous. So go to that second turnaround. Everybody say second, all right, and that'll, and that'll help you get it. If you're, that's if you're going north. If you're going south or that way, God bless you. Just keep going, and, and we thank you uh, for that. So we appreciate that so much. Let me encourage you, if you're not part of a church, we would love to have you here at Grace. We are on this journey of following Jesus together, and there's a reason the name of our church is Grace, because that's our story, that's our testimony, and we would love for you to be part of that. So thank you so much for doing it. Thank you for those of you who gave today. How many are glad you came to church today? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Go with God. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful day.